Die Sprachübertragung beginnt jetzt. Alle Teilnehmer befinden sich im Zuhörermodus. Our lithium ion battery systems really safe for the application. This is the question we are asking today. Welcome to the Fronius webinar. My name is Michael Raunig and together with my colleague Christoph Schierlinger, we are guiding you through this webinar today. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to use the chat function and afterwards at the end of the webinar, we will try to answer all your questions. First of all, what is on the agenda today? First of all, the description of the basic structure of lithium ion battery cells. So how is a cell really built up? What different cell chemistries are there? And what are the different uh, basic structures of the lithium ion cells? Next up is the product safety. So what is about the chemical safety, the electrical, the mechanical and the functional safety of the cell? So how it is possible to make a cell really safe? Another very important topic is, of course, the lifespan and the reliability of the cells. There is a lot of um, uh, talks about the lifespan and the reliability and how long a lithium ion cell really can live. Next up is the thermal behavior. The thermal behavior of lithium ion cells is very important because it is a big topic uh, about the right functionality of the cells themselves. Last but not least, there is the transport and warehousing of the cells. So how to transport and store the cells correctly. Let's go and start with the structure of the lithium ion battery cells. Basically, you can say that there are three main types of cell architectures. First of all, there's the cylindrical cell. Second, the pouch cell, or also called coffee bag cell. And third, there's the prismatic cell. All these three cell types differ in size and volumes. So for example, the smaller cylindrical cell can store a capacity of up to 3 ampere hours. While for example, the prismatic cell can store up to 60 ampere hours of capacity. To choose the right um, application for the different systems, it is always necessary to cope with the different cell architectures. So for example, the Fronius solar battery uses cylindrical cells within its system. Also, BYD for the B-Box uses cylindrical cells. The pouch cell, for example, is used from LG Chem and is built in the LG Chem resume. Uh, the Reno Zoe, for example, to mention a mobile application, uses as an electric car also the pouch cells, while prismatic cells are built in the BMW i3. On the left-hand side, you see some stationary systems like the Fronio solar battery, the LG Chem storage, and the BYD B-Box. Let's talk about the lithium ion battery composition. On the one hand side, every lithium ion cell has an anode and a cathode layer. These anode and cathode layers are separated by so-called separator layers. The separator layers is liable for uh, separating the anode from the cathode and to prevent the internal short circuit. Furthermore, there is a copper foil and the aluminum file. Uh, as you can see, the anode and the cathode layer, they are very thin. They are only about 130 micrometers thin. And therefore, it is very important uh, to have high quality standards uh, during the production of the cells. Because if there is a production failure, it is possible that there is an internal short circuit within the cell. So as you see, production of cells is very important. Next up is the characteristics of the cylindrical cell. In our case, at the Fronius solar battery, we use the LF Bose standard, so the lithium ion phosphate standard. Um, the cells have a voltage uh, about 3 pound 2 volts, and we have a capacity of 3 ampere hours. The cell itself is called 2665-0 cells. Um, therefore, the size of the cell is 26 millimeters in the diameter of the cell, and the height of the cell is 65 millimeters. Furthermore, there are three safety devices, which I will talk later on. The basic buildup of each cell is that there is a separator layer, a cathode layer, then again a separator layer, and then an anode layer. And therefore, the cell itself is winded up to a battery cell within the housing. Furthermore, there is an isolator on each side of the cell uh, that again should prevent an internal short circuit of the cell. Furthermore, there is a positive pole and a negative pole on each side of the cell. As well, 
as the safety functions like the PTC and the safety vent within the cell. So let's talk now about the Fronio Solar battery built up itself. Within the system we have 128 cells. These 128 cells are blocked to, one, to 16 battery blocks. Per battery block there are 8 cells paired, paired, uh, paired serial and connected to each other. 16 of these battery blocks are then coped to one battery module. And depending on the size, on the capacity of the Fronio solar battery, there are 3 to 8 battery modules within one housing. Another very important uh, module is the battery management system. It is called the BMS. The BMS is placed on top of the housing and it looks very similar to the battery modules itself. The battery management system is capable of doing the connection and the communication between the battery modules. The BMS is capable of charging and discharging characteristics of the battery modules itself. So the battery management system is really important when it comes to communication of the battery modules and is therefore capable of charge and discharge the modules. Let's now look about the overview of the different lithium ion chemistries. First of all, why is lithium interesting for batteries? If you compare the lithium ion battery chemistries with lead batteries, for example, you will see that the lead batteries are very robust and reliable and they have very low investment costs because they are cheap to buy. On the other hand, the weight so, uh, is very high and there is outgassing going on and therefore you need a first air circulation. Furthermore, there is a low cycle stability, so they have a lower lifespan. Furthermore, maintenance is needed by, uh, for lead batteries. So we use lithium ion batteries because they have simply higher cycle stability, they have no memory effect, they are lighter so they have less weight, they are very safe and have a high lifespan and the system efficiency factor is very high. Furthermore, high voltages are possible with lithium ion battery systems and no maintenance is needed. For now, unfortunately, the investment costs are still very high, so the systems are relatively expensive. So how can I now decide which uh, chemistry is the best for my application? First of all, there are some parameters that uh, give me information about the, uh, each different chemistries. So first of all, there's the specific energy and the specific power. The specific energy is uh, watt hours per kilogram and the specific power is watts per kilogram. So these two parameters give me information about how much energy can be stored within the cell and how much power can they deliver for my system. So these are very important factors when it comes to weight of the cell and the performance of the cell itself. Furthermore, there are very important uh, parameters like the safety in the case of a failure, uh, the performance at different environmental conditions and for example the lifespan. The cost is always based on the energy that can be uh, pulled out of the cell and can be feed in, in the cell again. So the charging and discharging costs. An uh, optimal cell would now have the optimal uh, parameters of each of these parameters. So the optimal cell will perform very good at each of these parameters. Unfortunately, there are different cell chemistries and you always have to compare which cell chemistry fits best for your application. In our case, the LFP technology is the best uh, way to choose because uh, LFP technology has a very high lifespan, so the longevity of the cells is very high. And on the other side, the safety of the cells is very high. Unfortunately, the specific energy is lower. In our case, that is not that much of a problem because uh, when it comes to stationary systems, it is not that problem that the specific energy isn't that high because this is not very, really a factor. If you compare a stationary system, for example, that is placed in a technical room in the house, it isn't so much of a problem when the system itself is uh, um, heavier than another system or it takes more place. If you compare these to um, mobile application, let's say an electric car, 
it is very important that the battery itself isn't too heavy or isn't too big. Because as you know in cars it is always a matter if the battery is too heavy because you can't exceed a different uh, weight. And it is also very important that the battery isn't too big. So for example for a mobile application like the electric car, the NMC technology, the nickel magnesium cobalt oxide technology uh, would fit better because the specific energy is higher. Therefore you can uh, ensure that for example in an electric car the specific energy is high enough so that you can gain enough energy from the battery to power your car. If, when we talk about LFP technology today uh, then always the cathode material is meant. At the anode material always graphite is the source because graphite is the state of art material for anodes today. This is just because uh, the energy density for example, the power density, the safety and the stability is very good for graphite. Uh, when we talk now about the cathode material, the chemistries differ a lot. For example, if you compare the LFP technology to the LCO technology, you see that the LFP technology is very safe and stable, while as the LCO technology is not so safe and not that stable. So it is always important that you choose the right lithium ion chemistry for your application. So now how is it possible to really make um, a battery cell really safe? So the safety of lithium ion battery cells is often doubted because there is experience with consumer electronics like smartphones, laptops and tablets. But it is to say that lithium isn't lithium. For example, if you watch the, the window on the right, uh, you see that there is a stable uh, voltage uh, stability window. So within these voltage uh, parameters, it is safe to say that the cell is in a very stable condition. On the left hand side, you have the deep discharge level and on the right hand side, you have the over voltage level. It should be prevented that a battery cell um, is in these uh, voltage levels so that there is always a safe state for the cell voltages. If you compare now the LFP technology, you will see that the, uh, the, the voltage level is a very low one. So the charging and discharging process uh, differs not a lot from the voltage. If you compare this now to the LCO technology, uh, which is also used in the consumer electronics, so for example smartphones and laptops, you will see that there is a high demand of uh, voltage levels. So the voltage level rises up and goes down in case of charging and discharging. In the case of failure now, if there is a failure within the cell, the cell voltage can rise up to a very critical level. So this means that the cell voltage then is in a critical level and the cell itself can gaze out and can be damaged. And this is a very bad condition because if the cell then is damaged, there is a so-called thermal runaway, which can lead to uh, to burn of the of the battery cell. So now you can see that, for example, with the LFP technology, uh, it is not possible to get in such a critical uh, status because the LFP technology just doesn't mention these cell voltages that it gets critical. So this is a very um, good opportunity for the LFP technology because it's really safe. Let's now talk about the safety of high voltage battery systems. Uh, the product safety of battery systems really cares about the chemical safety. The chemical safety is all about the active cell material, uh, the cell architecture itself, so which cell architecture is needed, and uh, safety devices like the shutdown separator within the cell. Furthermore, there is the electrical safety. Uh, this is about the insulation of cabling and housing of the cells. And furthermore, there is the, chemical, uh, the mechanical safety, whereas there is the system architecture and the degasification of the housing. All these three system parameters um, cope with the functional safety. And the functional safety is about the cell monitoring, so the sensors of the cell monitoring to maintain the cells themselves. And therefore you see that the BMS is very important for cell monitoring because the BMS always connects my modules and always uh, copes for the right uh, application. So the BMS is a very important factor when it comes to battery storage systems. Another very important factor is the blocked cell capacity. 
every battery cell has a so-called nominal capacity or so-called a gross capacity. This is the capacity the cell really can deliver. From the nominal capacity, there is the so-called usable capacity, the net capacity. This is the capacity that the user can use from the battery. So on the top of that, there is the blocked cell capacity that should prevent the cell from overcharging. On bottom, there is the brick protection and this should prevent deep discharge. It is now depending on the cell chemistry uh, whether this block capacity should be big enough or not. So, for example, if you have the NMC technology, the block capacity on top should be very high because the cell voltages differs a lot. When it comes to LFP technology, for example, the block capacity doesn't need to be so high because uh, the cell voltages are very stable within charging and discharging of the cell. So, this always depends on the cell chemistry that is used in the application. Furthermore, there is the thermal management system. So thermal care of the cells is very important. Since there is an idle temperature around 20 degrees of Celsius, um, at these 20 degrees of Celsius, at this idle temperature, it is possible that the cell really delivers the maximum output of power. So 100% of the net capacity can be delivered at the idle temperature. If the temperature of the cell now lowers, for example, to zero degrees or below, the inner resistance of the capacity of the, of the cell rises up and for example then it is only possible to deliver 70% of the cell capacity. And this is very bad because then I have less power to use in my home or in the application. Furthermore, it is possible that cell aging takes place while charging a very cold battery cell. If there is a thermal management system, the thermal management system will then heat up the battery cells to reach the idle temperature again. On the other side, it is very bad if a cell gets too hot because if the cell warms up, uh, the power will also be reduced. In the worst case, down to 0%. So if a battery cell gets too hot, you always lose power and furthermore, you get cell aging if the cell is too hot for a longer time. In the worst case, there can be the thermal runaway, which will blow up the cell and uh, leads to degasification. If there is a thermal management within the system, uh, cooling will take place and brings back the temperature to the idle temperature. In our case, at a stationary system, this thermal management system is very easy because uh, the stationary system is often placed within, for example, the technical room of the house and therefore there are temperatures around 10 or 15 or 20 degrees Celsius. So if you have these, um, these temperatures within the cells, it is not so, so important to uh, mention about the thermal management because then you always have the idle temperature within the cells. So in comparison with a mobile application, for example, in an electric car, the electric car always stands outside even if there is uh, below zero degrees or even if it's very hot outside. And therefore, uh, mobile applications need to be uh, controlled, also thermally, because uh, then the temperature of the cell needs to be controlled. So this is a very big difference between stationary and mobile systems, for example. Furthermore, all these parameters and together with the battery management systems, uh, these parameters impact on battery cycle life overall. So if you compare on the left bottom of the, of the screen, um, consumer electronics like smartphone and netbook, um, they have a very low cycle life. So the durability of the systems is very low. You can gain out the number of cycles from 200 to 500 cycles per life. So this is because of the fact the cells are not maintained by BMS and there is no thermal management for these cells. Because if your smartphone is in the sun and it gets very hot, the cells will age very, very fast. On the other hand side, if you take on the right upper corner the electric car or a stationary battery, it is possible to get a lot more number of cycle for the cycle life. This is because, because of the cells, they are maintained by the BNS and they have thermal management system and they have just a simple uh, different cell chemistry. And with all these factors together, it is possible to reach uh, up to 5,000 and more number of cycles for the cycle life. So, in case the durability for these systems is very high uh, in case of consumer electronics. 
So it is not possible to compare consumer electronic uh, cells with stationary battery cells, for example, because there are such difference. Let's go to the safety devices within the cell. So when it comes to safety aspects regarding the high voltage parts, there is always a safety during the standard operation of the system. So this is all about the operational safety and the charging safety of the system. Furthermore, there are safety procedures during maintenance and service. So there is, for example, in our system, the maintenance plug. There is a safety plug. This is the red plug you can see in the picture. And this plug uh, ensures uh, power flow within the modules. So for example, during maintenance, this plug is pulled out to ensure that there is no energy on the modules left. Furthermore, there are strategies for accident and failures of the cell. So for example, there's the PTC, the CID, the circuit interceptive device, and the safety valve. These are safety strategies to avoid overcharging and over discharge of the battery cells. I will talk about this later on. So now we have really the cycle of stability. There is the cell, the battery pack, the BMS, the power supply and the load. Within the cell, it is all about the general architecture, the PTC, the CID and the safety valve. The BMS is always capable of communication, the thermal control and the charging control. When it comes to the load, it is always necessary for accurate handling of the load, uh, the place of installation and the safety distances. So let's now take a look about the safety mechanism within the cell. Uh, first of all, there's the PTC. The PTC is just a protection against high currency in within the cell. So if the current within the cell gets very high, the PTC increases the inner resistance of the cell and therefore um, avoids a, a damage to the cell itself. Furthermore, there are safety devices like the circuit interceptive device, the CID. This is just a pressure valve that opens up. If there is pressure within the cell, the pressure valve opens and it leads to a power cut. So there is no power anymore within the cell and it avoids dangerous uh, situations. Furthermore, there is a safety valve. So if the, if the pressure within the cell uh, continues to rise, the safety valve opens up and it leads to a breaking point within the cell. And therefore the cell is uh, able to gas out and therefore interrupts the power flow itself. So these are really safety devices within the cell that makes the cell itself safe. Now, uh, transport and warehousing. I would recommend my colleague Christoph uh, to talk about transport and warehousing. Thank you, Michael. So, um, we will talk about the last topic here and we will start with the packaging. So, we have here uh, a few informations, but these are according to the Austrian uh, guidelines. So, please consider there can be national obligations for your country um, so please check them too. So um, due to the high capacity of the solar battery, um, it falls into dangerous goods uh, classification 9 and must be packed uh, and transported according to the following regulations. Um, what does uh, this regulation say? Uh, basically you have to put stickers on the packaging um, the ones you see on the bottom of the screen. Um, we have the dangerous goods classification 9 and the UN 3480 um, sticker and these have to be on the package itself. So uh, when we look at the whole package of such a battery system uh, we can see on the left hand side uh, the empty housing then we can see eight battery modules, so it's the biggest version of this Fronius solar battery. And you can see on each of these battery module packagings, um, there is these ADR classification 9, so for dangerous goods. And on the top right corner, you can see the BMS, the battery management system. Um, please also notice that you can't um, switch components such as battery modules between two batteries. So please keep them separate. Um, it, it's not working very well. <laughs> okay, now to the transport. Um, we have here some regulations um, by Wien norm. 
um, for road, rail, sea freight and air freight. Um, of course, I guess for you as an installer, it's much more important uh, the road regulation. So we talk about uh, this regulation um, uh, a little bit um, yeah, in detail. So what does this ADR regulation say? Um, basically, it means you can um, carry um, uh, battery systems up to a weight of 333 kilograms without any specific uh, driving license. So um, these are uh, these uh, 333 kilograms. It's um, roughly around two uh, solar batteries you can carry. Um, the only thing you have to consider is there has to be a fire extinguisher on board the vehicle. If um, the weight of the batteries exceed 333 kilograms, uh, the transport has to be labeled with uh, the dangerous goods um, sticker and also the driver needs a specific driving license. Um, in case of a B2B transport, uh, so a business to business transport, for example from your factory you want to um, carry around the battery to a, a fair trade, uh, a fair show. Um, in this case you, you have to um, uh, take with you the ADR document uh, anytime. So um, another point, uh, as installer you don't have to um, take an ADR transport document with you when you deliver uh, the battery to the end customer. It's a, a very interesting topic here. So uh, up to the next point. So what's on uh, such a packaging um, of a solar battery? We can see here from left to right uh, the ADR note which you have to fill in in some cases. Um, next to that uh, on the bottom we can see the Fronia serial number with the QR code you need for the registration on SolarWeb. Uh, on top of that, we can see the Sony product information. And on the far right, we can see the installation guide. And on the very top, we can see a thing, it looks like a vignette. Uh, it tells you the latest time for installation. So the battery comes with a specific um, uh, charge level. Um, if the charge level drops under a certain limit, um, you can't install the battery anymore. You have to send it back to Fronius and we have to recharge it if we can. It's um, not in every um, case. Um, so please check this date. Uh, please check the vignette and install it in time. Okay, now to our last point here, the warehousing, the storage. So when we talk about uh, Fronius solar batteries, um, we talk about very safe, highly safe uh, batteries with long service life and a low level of self-discharge. But um, nevertheless, it is, it is still a potential risk. Um, and to prevent any kind of, of uh, danger, you have to store it appropriately. So we from Fronius uh, recommend just store it in the original packaging. Um, under a temperature of minus 40 to 60 degrees Celsius and a humidity of maximum 80 percent and there should be no problem. Um, please also make sure this, uh, the room you store the battery in is well ventilated and there is uh, no direct sunlight or other heat sources. Um, it isn't good uh, anyway for electronic. Um, Another point, the installation place. Um, here we don't have this big range. Um, we recommend an installation temperature of plus 5 to plus 35 uh, degrees Celsius and only indoor installation. So there is no outdoor installation possible with this battery type. Um, uh, and a relative humidity from 0 to 95%. Um, also make sure there is enough room volume, at least 8 cubic meter. Um, it has to do with the air volume. Uh, it's just uh, for safety reasons. So we recommend a technic room or for example a basement 
where you have consistent temperatures between 15 or 20 degrees um, according to Austrian uh, standards. <laughs> okay, so um, now I think we have some more information from you, Michael. Thank you, Christoph. Um, if you want to gain further information, like the safety data sheet and the installation guideline, you can go to our website, fronius.com, and go to the downloads. Uh, there you also get, for example, the hazardous good information. Also, I want to kindly um, ask you to attend to our trainings, so you're very kindly invited for our trainings. You can find them on fronius.com uh, for, and go for events, and then you will find our trainings. There we have different trainings, like um, topics like battery safety, uh, batteries, and also, for example, the optimization of self-consumption. Furthermore, we are also on YouTube, and there are Phonius video tutorials, for example, how-to videos. So, for example, how to install a battery system. This is also very informative, and you can also find them on our website at uh, www.phronius.com. So, thank you very much for your attention, and now we want to ask the questions that we gained during the webinar. Mm -hmm. So, Christoph, can you please tell us the questions? Yeah, so we got uh, a few very interesting questions today. Um, so I will tell you this one. Um, Michael, you told us earlier about the, the blocked capacity of such a, a battery. Um, how can we um, imagine this? Is, this? is this some kind of mechanic um, uh, safety or can you um, explain this a little bit? So, uh, regarding the block capacity, it is always uh, notable to say um, that, the, uh, that the manufacturer itself does a software limitation for this block capacity. So, the end customer itself doesn't need to care about the block capacity because this is always a software limitation from the manufacturer. So, the end customer doesn't need to care about, oh my god, I can't charge my battery up to 100% because this is very harmful for the battery cells. No, that's not. So this is always a BMS a software limitation, and therefore it is always the case of the of the manufacturer that has to limit these factors. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, we will answer the the other questions by chat. So I guess we can say. Yeah, thank you for your attention today, and thank you for visiting our webinar. Um, I hope we see you next time at one of our trainings, or if you tune in to our webinars, we will be very pleased. Thank you for your attention for now, and see you the next time at Fronius. Thank you very much.